Dr. Jacques Gauthier is a distinguished international lawyer and scholar. He holds a doctorate from, uh, in international law from the University of Geneva and was called to the Ontario Bar in 1976. Dr. Gauthier has had a diverse practice in public and commercial international law, corporate and commercial law, immigration law, and trademark law. Dr. Gauthier has served as legal counsel to the governments of Ontario, France, Spain, and Mexico. Now, in addition to his busy practice, he is currently the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the International Center for Human Rights and Democratic Development. He is the uh, Vice Chair, but he is not here in that capacity today, speaking, of course, from his legal expertise. He's also a very active member of the Ontario section of the Canadian Bar Association, where he served on the Council and has chaired numerous committees. His other achievements include co-founding the Canadian Foundation of Children, Youth, and Law, which is otherwise known as Justice for Children. And for those of us who have ties in that area, it is a very well-known organization. I think you were even a co-founder, as I recall. And he was named uh, previously as a Chevalier of France's Ordre National du Mérité, which is obviously a great honor. Now, Dr. Gauthier has written a 1,300-page definitive doctoral thesis based on 20 years of research into the history of Jerusalem's old city that clearly documents the legal status and right of the Jewish people to claim sovereignty. With all the misinformation that is going on these days about this issue, and the way in which it is, and you'll, you'll forgive me my own views, the way in which it is being manipulated for political expediency, it is particularly timely and fortunate that we are able to hear from such a recognized legal expert with true legal analysis as opposed to the political expedient analysis. And I might add, this is an expert learned from Dr. Gauthier as he explodes the myths and exposes the facts. Thank you for being here, Dr. Gauthier. It is such a privilege for me to be here. I have to say bonjour. With a name like Jacques Gauthier, I have to say a few words, and I will cite a few authorities in French later just to test your French. Many, many centuries ago, uh, Nehemiah, confronted by his neighbors, including an Arab leader, made the statement to them, the God of heaven will grant us success, us, his servants, but you have no share or claim or right or stick in Jerusalem. I was quoting from the book of Nehemiah in the Hebrew Bible. The claim that uh, the Holy Land, that Jerusalem belongs to the Jewish people, is one that uh, has been made over and over again. It's not a new claim. My quest over 25 years ago was to check out the legal foundation of that claim. Do the Jewish people today have the right to take the position that under the law of nations, under international law, they have a legitimate, valid claim to the city of Jerusalem and other components of the Holy Land. Uh, the pursuit of the historical truth, the pursuit of an understanding of the facts when you're dealing with Jerusalem is a very humbling process. Let me explain. I never intended to spend 25 years on this issue. But after 10 years of research, I regularly would pick up articles and books, look at the bibliography, and find that I didn't recognize any of the books or most of the books that were cited there. That's after 10 years. After 15 years, I was still overwhelmed by the literature, by the number of Jewists, by the number of historians, by the number of theologians, by the number of political scientists who tackle the question of Jerusalem. It was like trying to put together a puzzle with 10,000 pieces. And as a lawyer, I can tell you this. 
If you're going to pass judgment about anything in your life, whether you're a judge in court or not, it is very likely that you're going to make the wrong decision, make the wrong call, have the wrong judgment, if the facts that you're dealing with are not all the facts, or if there's been a distortion of the facts, because the law arises out of facts. So for me, the key thing was to go back into history and understand what happened, what was decided before, to figure out what the rights are now. And it did take a long time, but ultimately, and it took this, this was actually 10 pounds. It's uh, 3,250 footnotes. Those who were supervising me at the University of Geneva, the Graduate Institute, basically said, well, you're touching something rather controversial. We're not interested in your views and your opinions. You better back up absolutely everything that is set out in your document. Then I was upset at them because they made me go over things. They made me spend weeks on a footnote, one footnote, weeks, so that I would pass their test. Today I'm thankful to them. Because when I'm introduced, and my name is not Tony Blair or Henry Kissinger, I'm not as a great international name or celebrity. So if I'm introduced to leaders of nations, as I have been, leaders of our government, as I have been. And I said, well, I want to talk to you about Jerusalem. I do this. <laughs> and I say, I've spent a lot of time on this. And I think I've come up with some valid legal conclusions. And I want to talk to you about those conclusions today. You can imagine, after this amount of time, to be given 45 minutes <laughs> to summarize historical perspective, religious dimensions, and, and political science aspect, and ultimately the legal consequences, is quite a challenge. So tie up your belts. We're going to go for a supersonic adventure here, because time is of the essence. Perhaps we could turn down the lights. As uh, was mentioned in the introduction, um, it's incredible how much is written about the status of Jerusalem, which is based on a distortion of the truth. The issue of sovereignty over the city of Jerusalem remains without doubt one of the most intractable, controversial, sensitive problems in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Many times over the 25 years, people would tell me, hurry up, they're about to resolve this. And I would say, well, if you've read the stuff I've read, don't worry. <laughs> the issue's been there for a long time, and it's not soon going to go away. The big question these days is to divide or not to divide Jerusalem. It's almost like if one was asking to be or not to be. It's that crucial. What I say to my friends, particularly my Jewish friends, who are willing to say, well, we should divide, we'll never have peace unless we divide Jerusalem. I say to them, well, do you understand what the concept of dividing Jerusalem entails? You can't just decide we're going to divide without deciding where you're going to put the dividing line. And that's the problem. And that's why I want to talk to you about the old city of Jerusalem. The old city of Jerusalem is in the middle of what is the municipality of Jerusalem. The little yellow area that you see on this map is where the, the old city is located. And the old city is a relatively small piece of real estate. But, in fact, it's 215 acres, four kilometers of walls around it. These walls built around the 16th century. And um, it, it's often misunderstood how significant the old city is, not only for the Jewish people, but from the perspective of the Palestinians and the Arabs. Israel, until this week, 
is taking the position that all of Jerusalem should be under the sovereignty of the State of Israel. The Palestinian Authority, with the support of most of the nations of this world, is taking the position that everything on the east side of the Green Line are to become part of the new Palestinian state. Now, what does that mean? Have a look at this. If you do it that way, the only thing left of Jerusalem would be what you see in the dark blue. Connected to the light blue, which is part of the state of Israel, if we did it that way, the dark green would be the Palestinian Jerusalem, and the light green is all part of the Palestinian state. Again, dividing Jerusalem is not the problem. The problem is where, how do you divide that city? Back to the green line. As a lawyer, I am stunned by what I read in resolutions of the United Nations in various publications in respect to the Green Line. What is the Green Line? In April of 1949, April 3 to be specific, an agreement was signed between the State of Israel and Jordan after the War of Independence. In Article 2, it is specified that although there is a line which is where the fighting starts, it is recognized that no provision of this agreement shall in any way prejudice the rights, claims, and positions of either party here to in the ultimate peaceful settlement of the Palestine question. I mean, you don't have to go to law school to understand what I've just read. The parties agree that even though it was a, a demarcation where the military conflict would end and that the, the Israelis would be on one side of the line and the others would be on the other side of the line, both parties stated in the agreement, which has never been revoked or annulled, that that was not to be the source of legal rights. And yet today, as I have discussions with different parties, the green line comes out as if it has some magic sacredness in law. It doesn't. On the contrary, it was specified that it was never intended to be used in support of the claim of one or the other. The old city of Jerusalem. <coughs> There is no possibility of any peace agreement in respect to the Holy Land without dealing with the question of the Old City. You must understand that this area of Jerusalem, and I'm showing you Jerusalem during the first century before the destruction by the Roman legions. Jerusalem, if you took a picture of Jerusalem, from the first century until the middle, two quarters of the way through the 19th century. Jerusalem was the old city. The old city was Jerusalem. Here's Jerusalem after it was rebuilt by the Romans, 135 AD, known as Talia Capitolina. The expression myth was mentioned earlier. I have read so many <coughs> arguments in respect to a solution involving Jerusalem where the author, including Dennis Ross, who was the chief negotiator for Clinton in, in the year 2000, takes the position that the way you're going to solve the issue of Jerusalem is, is, is for the parties to come to the table forgetting their historical national myths, their national dreams, their legends. I take the position, and that's why I work on this, that the only way you're ever going to resolve it is by taking the very opposite approach. Understand the claims, understand the underpinnings of the claims of the other parties. It is a labyrinth. It is a complex puzzle. But there is no way that you'll get anywhere if you treat their position as a myth, whether it's a 
Jewish position, a Muslim position, or a Palestinian position, or a Christian position. That's why I have studied in this document the roots, the, the foundations of all those things. Again, Jerusalem, over 19 centuries, was the old city. Many of you have seen the lithographs, these beautiful lithographs, uh, with, with Arabs sitting on camels with the walls of Jerusalem in the background. I've got a whole collection of those at home. I've put in 250 of my pictures and lithographs in this, in this document to support the fact that this is not about myths. For those who say that it was never a temple, that there was never a Jerusalem in the first century, I invite them to do what I did just a few months ago. I went to Rome. I went to see the Arco de Tito, the Ark of Titus. And if you look at this Ark, which is there today, unless some strange thing happened, um, you go and, and you look under the Ark, and you see the Jewish prisoners carrying the holy instruments of the temple. You see them depicted. I mean, it's been beaten up by, 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 by the decades and the centuries, but um, it's there. When the Romans defeated, the Jews destroyed Jerusalem. They did what they normally did after a major victory. They had a big parade in Jerusalem, and there were Jewish slaves carrying these holy instruments. It's, it, the ark was built ten years after the destruction of Jerusalem. It's hard for me to agree with the theory of the myths. This is a fact. They're old facts, but it's true. Here's Jerusalem during uh, the 12th century. You see the configuration of the city, basically the old city of today. Here's a lithograph, mid-19th century. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but in this one you see absolutely nothing outside the walls, even though there are structures there. Here's a map in a French book which shows a few little buildings outside the walls in the middle of the 19th century. So when people talk about dividing Jerusalem, when the nations talk about dividing Jerusalem, when the, when the Palestinians who are considered to be the trustees of the Muslim world, as far as the holy places are concerned, talk about dividing Jerusalem. What Jerusalem do you think they have in mind? <laughs> Moving quickly now to uh, the roots of your title, or the title of the Jewish people. Herzl, he wasn't the first one to write about his solution to the the problems faced by the Jews around the world. If you look at the writings of Moses Hess so, and Skir, uh, you'll see that they were, they, they did an amazing job articulating the need for a Jewish state. Now, this is very relevant today when Prime Minister Netanyahu just a few days ago asked for recognition of the state of Israel as a Jewish state. What was the title of the thesis? published by Herzl in uh, 1896. There was a title and a subtitle. It was entitled, The Jewish State. That's what it was all about. The subtitle was A Modern Solution to the Jewish Question. It's important to remember this historically because what evolved from his very important contribution was the Basel Conference of 1897 and a, a program to establish a Jewish state. The difference between Herzl and others who wrote about Zionism is that he was really the founder, the architect of the political movement, which was then picked up by person that I became very intimate with because I spent about seven years looking at his documents, Hein Wasman. The Balfour Declaration. Because of the emergence of the Zionist movement internationally and what was happening in England in the middle of the war, let's never forget, 1917, you're in the middle of the First World War and the British are desperate, the Allies are desperate, and they want the support of the Jewish people around the world. The Balfour Declaration was 
approved not by one man, Balfour. He was a member of the cabinet, the war cabinet. The leader of that cabinet was Lloyd George. What's important about the Balfour Declaration is that it's often used to confuse the answers to the question about the legal rights. It is not a source of rights for the Jewish people or a source of obligations for others such as the Palestinians because it was a document issued by one state. And yet it was a very important document. It triggered many things. But so often I will see a reliance upon the Balfour Declaration as if it was an edict of uh, the International Court of Justice. It was one nation played a key role in supporting the Zionist movement in those days. I want to underline something. You want to make a note, remember this. It's relevant, it'll be relevant in a few minutes. The very initial draft that came from Baron de Rothschild to Lord Balfour Included, included the words, Palestine should be reconstituted as the national home of the Jewish people. Should be reconstituted as a national home. When Balfour got his draft in August of 1917, he didn't change it. He kept it. But subsequently, after a discussion in cabinet, the cabinet was so concerned about the scope and the extent of the rights that would be given to the Jewish people if that term was kept. Because if you're reconstituting, you have to look at what you had before. You have to look at where Jerusalem was historically. You have to pay attention to where Hebron is, is located, you know, the cave where the patriarchs were, were buried. You have to pay attention to the concept of Shiloh. You have to pay attention to all these things that happen biblically and historically if you introduce this reconstitution notion in a legal document. So the cabinet said, no. Okay? Let's leave it there for a moment. We'll come back to that. Here's Balfour, a very, very special friend of the Jewish people. And the person who received the declaration, Lord <coughs> Rupta Rostra. Let's move quickly to the, mid, the, the moments in history which decide everything to this day. The Paris Peace Conference. In 1919, in January, the Allies, after their victory over Germany, convened in Paris, Quai d'Orsay, La Salle des Horloges, beautiful big room on the Quai d'Orsay, to discuss the status of the territories of the defeated nations. In Paris, they spent six months trying to decide what to do with the territories. Here's the Quai d'Orsay. It is still there. looks like that today if you go for a stroll in Paris. And these four individuals, there were actually five leaders that were very important, but these four are particularly important represented the Supreme Council of the Allied Nations. So when we're going to get into legal stuff now, this is what you have to remember. In Paris, there was, in that room, there were claims presented. Claims presented in respect to the European territories of the defeated nations. In the old days, under international law, if you defeated somebody, if you conquered the territory, guess what happened after the victory? You just took over. That was the way things used to be done. And there are millions of examples of that. Something changed in Paris. Something changed after the First World War. War. But it changed in a very particular way. The Allies did what the others used to do. They took away title from the defeated nations. The sovereignty that belonged to the Germans in, in some areas, and the Hungarians and the Bulgarians, was taken away from them. But what was different is that having taken away, dispossessed these nations of sovereignty, they didn't take it necessarily for themselves. They did something else with these territories. That was new. In Paris, concerning the Ottoman territories, there was a Zionist 
delegation that presented the position of the Jewish people. And there was an Arab delegation led by the Ashamite tribe, the Ashamite family. Based in Mecca, the father, Hussein, you see his picture, had his headquarters in the city of Mecca. That was the ruling family of the Arab world. It's so important to remember this. They spoke for the Arabs. In Paris, there wasn't a Palestinian delegation, there wasn't an Iraqi delegation, there wasn't a Lebanese delegation. The Arabs wanted one gigantic independent territory. So what's happened subsequently is very troubling. Having received, in essence, almost everything they wanted, then they turn around and subdivide themselves into inhabitants or components of the territories to try to gain more rights. This is a map that shows uh, the aspirations of, of the Arabs at their greatest extent. In Paris, the son of Hussein chosen to negotiate was Faisal. You see his picture on the left. The son um, who stayed in, in Mecca was uh, Hussein and Abdullah on the right is someone that you will have to contend with too because he ultimately becomes the emir and the king of Jordan. One family. That family, led by Faisal, had meetings with the leaders of the Zionist organization. They met with Wiseman before the Paris Peace Conference and entered into written agreements, which I have attached to my thesis, in which they said, we, the Arabs, are going to support the Zionist movement and the Zionist claim in respect to Palestine, provided you support our claim for a large independent state elsewhere. Here's a picture of... Uh, Wiseman, again, in case uh, there's an allegation of myth here, or dreams, or, or uh, uh, Wiles re rewriting of history. Here's Wiseman meeting with his own. They respected each other. They had a good relationship. At the time of the peace conference, you have to keep in mind that there were only about 200 to 250,000 Jews in Palestine, and about 7 to 800,000 Arabs. The plan of the Zionist organization was to ask a friendly state, Britain, to set up a trust so that the Jewish nation could grow and ultimately it would lead to the establishment of a Jewish state. It's all set out in a document published by uh, the Zionist organization and the author was Sasha. It's there in great detail. There's no doubts about what they were trying to achieve. What the Zionist organization asked for and, and you have to imagine the courtroom. I'm going to make the case that those who sat at the table listening to the claims had the power of this position. They could decide what to do with the, ter the territories that were the targets of the claims. What did the Zionists ask for? Look at the opening statement. The contracting parties shall recognize the historic title of the Jewish people to Palestine and the right of the Jews to reconstitute. Whoops. They're, they're, they're going back to that. They're asking for that. The very term and concept and notion that was not introduced in the Balfour Declaration. They go to the Paris Peace Conference. The courtroom is la salle des horloges. The judges are Lloyd George, Clemenceau, Orlando, and Wilson, four leaders, and the Japanese Prime Minister plays a role. There are five nations there. I'll come back to that. So they asked for this re reconstitution. The question is, when you go to court and you ask for something, it's not yours unless the panel, unless the judges recognize your claim. So the question becomes, was this demand? was this claim to Palestine. And Palestine in those days was the entire area, both east and west. Here's the map that was submitted by the Zionists. You'll see that there's a large chunk of territory 
on the east side of the Jordan River. That was attached to their submissions. And it coincided with uh, the distribution of the, of the Holy Land among the 12 tribes of, of, his, of Israel. It wasn't an accident that they picked the area that they did. The Treaty of Versailles and other treaties included the covenant of the League of Nations. One of the pillars of the claims of the parties here is what was introduced in Article 22, the establishment of a sacred trust for the well-being and development of peoples, a sacred trust of civilization. I contend that this provision in Article 22 is still relevant today. It's one of the pillars of the claim of the Jewish people. As a result of the six months in, in uh, Paris, many treaties were entered into with the defeated nations. I'm showing you the Treaty of Neuilly. Look at who is receiving the rights. The United States, British Empire, France, Italy, and Japan. It's those nations that decide who has a recognition of a claim and who will not have a claim recognized. Treaty of Versailles, again, you'll see that Germany renounces all of its rights in favor of the principal allied powers. Treaty of Trian Trianon. Hungary is, is the, the nation involved here. But you see who is receiving the rights? The reason that's relevant in law is because only those who have received title can give title. And these are the very nations who are going to give title to the Jewish people. This is what I'm going to show you. Here's a map of Europe after it's been reconfigured, restructured, after the six months in Paris. And this shows you who got what from whom. Germany had to give up some territories, Russia, Turkey, all these nations. And, and this map is in great detail. And this is support for my contention that these, this Supreme Council could do what they wanted. And you know what? Everything they decided later, they may have made some bad decisions, has been considered binding. And I'm going to show you that in the, in the Ottoman territories, everything that they decided has been considered binding and has, has remained the way they decided, with one exception. Only one people receive rights. And that people is still begging for the recognition of what they have already been given by the nations. I'm referring to the Jewish people. The nations should be ashamed at the extent to which they were enabled, they contravened, they breached the commitments that were made earlier. This is the Ottoman territories. We're now going to focus on the Ottoman territories. In Paris, the Supreme Council did not get around to deciding on the, on the presentations, on the claims, on the submissions made by the Zionist organization and the Arabs. They didn't decide, but they had all the information. They had the submissions. They go away with these submissions and reconvene in the city of San Remo on the Italian Riviera. If you go there, as I have, that's what it looks like today. I was so intrigued by the significance of this place that I, I traveled with... Uh, my wife and one of my daughters, uh, we, we have four daughters, and I'll take a moment to introduce my wife, Rani, who's right next to me and keeps an eye on the clock. <laughs> and then somewhere, one of my daughters over there, and we went over there to see this place. Why? Because in April of 1920, the Supreme Council, these men representing the nations who had the right to decide what to do, gathered in St. Remo. Why? To deal with other issues, but for two days, to make a decision. This is like the Court of Appeal of Ontario. I speak to my friends, the lawyers. They've, they've heard the submissions. They say, thank you, and they go away, and they deliberate. It happened in that place. And I urge each and every one of you who's concerned about the issues I'm presenting today to go to that villa. Go there. And it's now a luxury condo. It's subdivided it. And amazingly, I was able to rent an, an apartment for a few days within the villa. And, uh, you know, circumstances are intriguing sometimes. Uh, 
we ended up renting an apartment which was the very room where, where the Allies, the Supreme Council met. That's the room. You see the four chairs at the bottom of the U-shaped table? And uh, in case you've got your myth uh, perspective, here's a picture. While we were there, old ancient residents of the place heard about my work and came to us and gave us pictures, which don't exist anywhere else, of the Supreme Council meeting there. And on April 24, 25, the crucial decisions were made. I've got the entire minutes of these meetings attached to the thesis. And that's where it was decided that the claim presented by the Jewish people in Paris would be accepted and recognized in its integrity. This is where they decided that the claim presented by the Arabs concerning Iraq, concerning uh, what is now Lebanon and Syria, would also be accepted. In that decision, they take the principles of the Balfour Declaration and say, we're going to make it international law. It's, by the way, it's, it's now called, it's been upgraded. It was a villa, it's now called a castle. <laughs> it deserves to be called a castle. Now, in case you think I'm overstating and exaggerating, which happens with lawyers sometimes, when you have a cause that's dear to you, the importance of the conference. Here's what Wiseman said about it. The San Remo decision has come. That recognition of our rights in Palestine is embodied in the treaty with Turkey, because the treaty came out right after this. They put it into a treaty. And has become part of international law. This is the most momentous political event in the whole history of, the, of our movement, Zionist movement, and perhaps, no exaggeration to say, in the whole history of our people since the exile. He may be exaggerating. I wasn't. It's an important moment because it, it's, it's like a board of directors making a, de a decision. The, the Big Bang, the instant the rights were created, was then in San Diego. If opponents of what I'm saying say, well, that meaning could not have been that significant or relevant. Well, I say, wait a minute. This is where the Arab people got their rights. If you, if you remove that foundation, nobody's got any rights because these are the guys who have the power to make the decision. In the Treaty of Set, you will see again, this is a treaty that was after the decision in St. Remo. The Supreme Council has a treaty drafted that provides for the abandonment, the surrender of rights by the Ottomans. The United States is not mentioned here because there's a problem with Wilson at the time, but they signed a separate document, but they were one of the Supreme Council members. So the Treaty of Set was supposed to take away the rights from the Ottomans, from the Turks, and give it all to the Supreme Council in order that the Supreme Council could implement the trusts agreed upon, the mandates agreed upon in St. Remo, one in favor of the Jewish people, one in favor of the Arabs. I just want to show you quickly the treaties that came out of this, one relating to Syria and Lebanon. This is the mandate for Syria and Lebanon, an international binding treaty. It specifies that all of this is for whom? For the population inhabiting the mandated territory. The one concerning Mesopotamia, Iraq, mentions again the entitlement of the inhabitants of those territories. But the mandate for Palestine is quite unique. It specifies that that territory is there for the establishment of a Jewish, and he stressed, Jewish national as laid down in the preamble. Now, for lawyers, this is interesting and very relevant. All of a sudden, everything that's in the preamble is part of this very key clause. What's in the preamble that is interesting to, to those who want to find answers? Look at the last part in red. In the preamble, 
drafted. I found this, you know, when you do work on this, every so often you find something fascinating and amusing. The one who drafted the preamble, which is now part of the dispository clause, was Balfour himself. And he got his revenge. Look at what he tucked into the preamble. The recognition for the Jewish people is based on their historic title and the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. So what? It wasn't in the Balfour Declaration. It's not a source of international rights and obligations. But this is the mandate for Palestine, a treaty recognized by all the nations that counted in those days, adopted by the Council of, of the League of Nations, adopted by the 51 members of the League of Nations. You cannot deal with this issue today and disregard the rights that were given in that document. If I put the three key clauses next to each other, you'll see that it's unique. What was done there was absolutely unique. There were so many documents, articles published on the implications of the mandate for Palestine. Tonoyevsky in his Théorie des mandats internationaux said, Il résulte que le peuple juif fait virtuellement partie des habitants de la Palestine. La population actuelle de ce pays ne constitue, au point de vue juridique, qu'une partie de la communauté palestinienne. What he's saying here is that the Jewish people worldwide are deemed to be virtual inhabitants of that territory as a result of this international legal document. What was then, if you, if you take it that, that approach, what was the population of Palestine back in 1920 or 22 when the Palestine mandate was approved by the League of Nations? It was about a million Arabs and maybe 14 million Jews. Virtually, they're considered inhabitants. The other territories, the principle of self-determination is being applied for the inhabitants of those territories. For Palestine, it's being applied for the Jews worldwide. Here's what happened as a result of Saint Mimo at the Villa de Vachon. Here's what comes out of all this. A large mandate over Syria and Iraq two separate mandates, and then the Palestinian one. 1921, there's a crisis because the French kicked out Faisal out of Damascus. Churchill goes to Cairo. That's a huge problem. The Arabs are going to revolt again. He wants a solution. He takes away from what was given to the Jewish people illegally and gives all of East Palestine. It's, there's only one mandate. There was no Palestine, a mandate for Palestine and, and Jordan or Transjordan. It was a mandate for Palestine. He takes two-thirds and gives it to Abdullah, another Ashamite ruler, as I mentioned before. Today, having decided that this blue area would be for the Jewish people under international law, we're now struggling to decide how much will be retained for the Jewish people. Treaty of Lausanne eventually is the, the final treaty that um, takes away the rights of, of the Turks. Article 80 of the UN Charter specifies that whatever rights were given to people before the UN Charter was, was, uh, was adopted are to be honored and respected. Nothing in the, in the statute shall be construed in or itself to alter in any manner the rights whatsoever of any of the states or any people. So for those who think that the establishment of the UN changed what happened before, it didn't. A lot of discussion these days is linked to uh, the partition resolution. Partition resolution was supposed to be a solution. Yes! The leadership of the Zionist movement was prepared to partition Palestine, but look at when this is taking place. Talk about duress. Talk about pressure. This is after the Holocaust. For your information, those leaders who supported uh, the Sanremo decisions 
did so way before the Holocaust because of the horrendous way the nations have treated the Jews over the centuries. They felt compelled in their conscience to give rights to the Jewish people in their ancient homeland because of that. Can you imagine what these men, if they were alive today, or these women, what they would say after the Holocaust? Section, the partition resolution was a resolution of the General Assembly. Under international law, I don't have time to get into it, these are not binding. If everybody had agreed to this and, and, and terms were incorporated in an international treaty later, then that would have become the source of rights and obligations. You should know that the partition resolution specifically took out, and you'll see that little dot in the middle, Jerusalem from, from the area for the Jewish state or the area for the uh, Arab state, it was going to be a special regime, and after 10 years, there, were going to be, there was going to be a referendum, and if you read what Ben Gurion said, what others said, they all said, well, in 10 years, we already have a majority. After 10 years, when the doors of immigration are open, we'll have a huge majority. We'll win that referendum, and we'll get Jerusalem. Here's the area, which went way beyond Jerusalem. It included Bethlehem, even. That was supposed to be part of the inter international regime. For those who say that, well, mandates, international mandates, that's ancient stuff. First World War, you know, how could we Jewish people, how could we assert rights today uh, when this happened so long ago? Well, wait a minute. The International Court of Justice, when it wasn't time to make, deny the rights of the Jewish people, in the case of Southwest Africa, uh, and, and the jurists should look at this decision. In 1950, there was an advisory opinion. And they made it clear that the Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, that the mandate documents were still effective and binding in determining the status of another mandated territory. 1966, huge decision by the International Court of Justice, where they repeat over and over again that all those things, all those rights that were given decades ago are still relevant and binding for every other nation but the Jewish people. If I read the more recent decision of the International Court of Justice in related to the relation to the fence or the wall. Today, uh, when you talk about dividing Jerusalem, you have to be aware of the fact that there are all sorts of religious obstacles. One of the problems stems from the fundamental view in, in Islam, in Islamic theology, it, you can call it replacement theology, that God at some point in time has cursed the Jewish people, it's all over, no redemption possible, same for the Christians, in case those of us who are Christians think we're in a better position. We've all been replaced, and it is fundamental for them to be able to continue to believe what they believe in, for this thing that's happening in the Holy Land today to stop them. What's happening there? The Jewish people are prospering. They have a very strong army. They're strong in technology. They have great educational institutions. They, and all those things start to remind you of redemption. But they can't be redemption because they are the chosen people now. So they, these are real problems, not little problems. In, in getting to a peace agreement because they can't possibly accept a permanent peace because their belief is that it's all over for everybody else and that the chosen ones, the ones who are to prosper in the whole world, not just the Holy Land, are the Muslim people. So that's why this amusing scene took place at Camp David in the year 2000. That's when my professors were telling me job. You can start working on your thesis. Uh, it, it's going to be resolved in a few days. And I said, don't worry. I'll keep working. Arafat, having been offered with 97% of what he wanted by Clinton, who had 17 war chests full of gold coins in the room to entice him, uh, wakes up one morning and his aide, he, he hasn't slept for three nights, he's very cranky, and his aides tell him, Arafat is driving away. There's a story that Madeleine Albright ran after him 
Um, they were running around after the limousine to try to catch up. Why? Because the high the night before said, there's not going to be a peace agreement on this. I've given you almost everything you want, but I want a clause that says it's a final treaty. It's permanent. It's it. You can't come back. He drove away. And it was a good move to drive away, because if he had signed what Bahak was asking him to do, he would have been killed the next day, because you're not allowed to do that. Because what's happening there is supposed to be temporary. There's so much more I would like to say, but I'm going to close here. The issue of dividing Jerusalem is, without doubt, one of the most complicated ones you could come up with. In my thesis, I did an analysis of about a hundred solutions proposed by others. I've got a color coded how to partition the old city. And uh, there's no shortage of solutions being proposed. The one thing I would say, with the most, um, so humbly and respectfully to the Jewish people, you like to disagree, you, you like to have different perspectives on things. And it's okay to, to, to perhaps continue to disagree on the best solution possible to these problems. But what I'm saying to you today is that if you look at my stuff carefully, there is no doubt that the decision as to who should have those territory has been made by those who have the power of disposition. It is a very hazardous thing to do not to be united at the very least on who's got title. I'm reminded of this movie, which I found interesting, it's called Braveheart, and Mel Gibson, and the British are fighting the, Sc the Scottish people. And England is prevailing most of the time, until the very end of the movie when something happens. The Scottish tribes unite, and things change. Right now, and, 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 and even just a few days ago, there was a prominent speaker here in Toronto talking about the need to divide Jerusalem. Well, I say to you, well, if, if what you're willing to do is to give up the supreme symbol of the old city, and especially the Temple Mount, then you won't have peace. Even if you're prepared to do that, because according to the theology that I read, what Hamas publishes in its charter, Hezbollah publishes, Iran announces, is the same thing that you see in mainstream documentation, including this book published in Saudi Arabia about the, the teachings and writings of King Saul. There is an enmity between the Jewish people and the Muslims, and they're not allowed to remain in any part of the land. Jerusalem is symbolic. It's important to understand your rights. If you can start with an understanding of the foundations legally, then perhaps with an understanding of the foundations of the claims of the other parties, maybe some, some solution can come out. Thank you. for a lot longer, but I know that there are questions in the room and that you all have to get back to business. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, 10 minutes more of questions and uh, there are microphones here and here for you to go to if you like. And Jacques has graciously agreed to answer questions and then we will have a, a formal conversation. Physical or 
or not. But uh, in any way, lately we heard that there was a proposal that uh, the PA would accept um, possibly that the organization of Islamic conference would manage the old city park that's money. And that in addition to all this, we have 57 Muslim states accepting Israel, and I think we have to accept Israel as a Jewish state because Jewish people uh, have established it. So there's that notion. And um, the other thing is that when you spoke of Theodore Herzl, yes, I'm going to have this question. And the other thing you um, mentioned was Theodore Herzl. Theodor Herzl also met the Ottoman Empire Sultan Abdallah, and he said he, he'd never give, um, first of all, the, the Sultan said he'd never give up Jerusalem because it should be in the hands of Islam. And Herzl replied that he, he um, that we could get around this difficulty and so forth, and um, we shall extraterritorialize Jerusalem so that it belongs to nobody. Excuse me, do you have a question? So there, there's you have to get to your question, so I'm, I'm sorry. you two questions. One, the recent proposal, and two, Herzl um, is in, was interested in accommodating with the Muslim world. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me start with the first question. Uh, what you're doing now is focusing on, on solutions, which I, I didn't really do today. My, my focus is trying to make sure you understand that after 25 years of research, I've concluded that a decision has already been made under international law. That territory, and as far as I'm concerned, the rest of what was Palestine, including what the Zionists gave up on the other side of the Jordan River, belongs to the Jewish people. Now, your question relates to my conclusion here is based on the research. I wish when I, when I started my work, I hoped that that would be the conclusion. But if my conclusion had been different, I'd be telling you some different things today. The, the solution you mentioned is problematic. Having said that I'm focusing on rights and not solutions, let me talk about the solution. And the problem is the, the Temple Mount. Because if you start dealing with partitioning the old city, there is no area on earth more sacred to the Jewish people than the Temple Mount. The Jewish state and the Jewish people have mismanaged the question of the Temple Mount badly. When I go to Israel and I pick up a brochure listing the most sacred Christian sites and Muslim sites and Jewish sites, and at the top of the list of the Jewish sites is the Western Wall. I have a problem with that. Because I care for the eastern wall, so the, 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 the southern wall, and the northern wall with the Temple Mount. And the problem with the western wall, which is in fact the most sacred place today where the people, the Jewish people worship, right? But it's not the most sacred territory. What, what do the Jewish people pray about when they go to the wall? Many of the prayers have to do with rebuilding what's on, on top of the Temple Mount. So, all over the place, now you see things almost presuming and assuming that the Jewish people are prepared to give up the Temple Mount. So, if you're going to start dividing the, 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 the old city, you better be, be prepared to give up the Temple Mount. The best way to, do, to deal with that is you don't divide the old city at all, you don't even go there. And you don't divide Jerusalem at all, you don't go there. <laughs> Herzl and the Turkish, uh, they, they did have an encounter. And, and it's a little unfair to Herzl to say that he was prepared, prepared to be compromising. Don't forget, this is a bit different era. It's the end of, uh, of the 19th century. And if you go to, Jew, to, to the old city in those days, there were almost nothing but old and poor people there. There was a state of desperation. And so don't blame Herzl for being willing to be more flexible because you're looking at history through, through the eyes of today. In those days, it was... The Jewish people had nothing. They were an oppressed people in the Ottoman territories. Also, two questions. Just so we get more questions, the questions have to be short. Very, very short. Why is it that throughout the years, negotiations and speeches, 
we never hear about the legal foundations of uh, Israel's rights. We hear a lot about the historical rights, but the legal rights are hardly ever mentioned, if at all. My and second, the Israel as well. Yeah. My second question is a very different question, which has to do with the conference that is going to take place at your university on the 22nd of June. Uh, my question here is, could the agenda of the conference be construed as offending Canadian law according to the United Nations Charter to Okay, first question. Why, you know, the Jewish people are, if you look at the, those who won Nobel Prizes over the last uh, hundred years, um, fairly educated and bright people. Why is it? And I've asked, I've been asked that question so often. Why is it that if this is not uh, nonsense, if, if, if this, these are valid conclusions and good research and my 3,200 footnotes are, are, are for real, why is it that the Jewish people don't know that? It's a good question. Can you imagine going to meet a prime minister, he wasn't prime minister then, but sitting down with Netanyahu, uh, sitting down with uh, former Ambassador Baker, who had been the legal counsel of, the, uh, of Israel for many years, and, and saying to them, by the way, I want to tell you about all the rights that you've been given under the law of nations. And, and I mean, it's, you can imagine that the initial reaction when this stranger sits down, whose name is not Kissinger or Tony Blair, um, what happens when we get into it? Is that all of a sudden there is a realization that pieces, key pieces of the puzzle were overlooked and, and, and that, that it took, you know, in, in fairness, it took 25 years for me to do it. And, and most of us don't have that time. And the Jewish people have had other preoccupations. And there is something that has to be said about the Holocaust. The Holocaust is so big, it's such a huge event of history that sometimes it's hard to look at the events before the Holocaust. It's a sort of an eclipse, or, or it's like a mountain chain that prevents you from, from looking before. So it's, the, the answer is a complex one, but it also has to do with the goal, the shameful conduct of the nations who have been given clearly rights to the Jewish people and to others and honored everything they promised to the others under the law. All of a sudden, they collectively keep denying, denying, denying. You know, it's not right for anybody to say that the Jews are trespassers in any part of the Holy Land. It's not right for anything. It's not right to call the Jewish people occupiers. It's hard, though, when Israel itself calls its presence in its territory occupation. But, you are the rightful owners of Jerusalem, of the old city, and of what's left of Palestine because you've more or less accepted what they did on the other side of the Jordan. Your, the conference that, that you mentioned, I, I, I don't want to get into that, but all I can say is that if you believe what I've said today, that the law of nations and the law of Canada, I mean, Canada's approved the mandate for Palestine. It was one of the 51 nations that approved the mandate for Palestine. Canada was a full participant in the peace conference. We sat at the table. We've signed the documentation that says these rights have been given. But can you blame the nations for not respecting your rights when you yourself don't know what your rights are? Uh, you had mentioned having been made to check and recheck your footnotes. And uh, I wanted to know uh, more about the peer review process of your book. Uh, how many people reviewed it? Who, who uh, were they? What their background was? And uh, also, where can the rest of us get a copy of the book? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I was a student at the Graduate Institute many years ago, and I did all the test exams, courses, didn't finish the thesis. And then um, by extraordinary circumstances, I was allowed to continue my work for a long time. Uh, the director of my thesis it was uh, Marcelo Cohen, Dr. Marcelo Cohen. His thesis, he's a 
Jewish man from um, originally from Argentina, writes and speaks uh, four or five different languages. His te thesis, which was on the subject of sovereignty in international law generally, not just having to do with, with Israel, uh, won the Guggenheim Prize, which is the first prize in international law. He is the most demanding individual that you can imagine. He um, did not agree with most of the arguments that I was trying to defend. And he's the one who said to me, Jacques, you know that we're on different sides of the spectrum here, but if you will defend and support and, and, and explain that everything carefully, I'll be your director. So he was, um, he sat there, I was, my, my defense soutenance de thèse, I defended my thesis in 2006 in Geneva. The president of the panel was Dr. Lucius, Lucius Kafrich, who's been on the International Human Rights Court for years, one of the most respected jurists internationally today. He was the president. He, um, he's not Jewish. Um, he took uh, a lot of time to review everything that I wrote and presided over the, the panel. And the third was a Jewish historian, who's quite famous in Europe. His name is Dyekov. And all of them, were very skeptical. They bombarded me with questions and they attacked almost every aspect of, of my thesis. And my wife was there, upset about the way they were attacking me. And um, another daughter was at the institute doing her doctorate now. And uh, my two, uh, two, three daughters will be at this institute as of September. Um, the, um, the end result is that they left after these attacks came back, and uh, these individuals are all referred to in the key part of the thesis. And they came back and said, uh, well, the first word of the president was, congratulations, Dr. Gauthier. So I thought, well, that's a good start. Because <laughs> you understand, because if you don't defend your thesis successfully, it's over. You can never do it again. That's it. So that was a possibility after my 25 years. My subject was sensitive, so it was a real possibility. And uh, basically, uh, Dr. Cohen, who uh, was my thesis director as well, came and hugged me and said, uh, I can't believe what, uh, what you put together. And even though I disagree with, because he's been acting as a Jew as legal counsel to uh, states that oppose Israel. Uh, and uh, and um, so I came out after being attacked. And I remember walking in and I said, after this, I'll stand anywhere <laughs> and I'll deal with your questions because they couldn't have put me through a more rigorous process. Um, many scholars, many uh, historians uh, have looked at this document and uh, I questioned me and I, I welcome the questions. And where can we get a copy of the book? <laughs> I, uh, I, I published 50 copies each time, uh, three times, and at one end. I've now got two or three copies. So I've been asked to do a book with a short edition, edition and I'm going to try to find the time to do that. Yeah, that's what we need. That's, yeah, because this one is uh, it's too heavy. It's also in French, isn't it? Sorry, we only have time for one more question because everyone has to go back to business, I understand. So remember, thank you. Uh, hi, Jacques. Hello, Norman. Uh, as, as a person who has actually read through that whole book, I want to say that it is a privilege and a pleasure to have read it and brought up the date on the history of our Jewish people and our, what I would call our inalienable rights to, I agree with you, the both sides of the majority, but we won't get into that. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for um, writing this and being a member of our community this way. And I was particularly struck in the book by one thing with regard to your treatment of the Muslim perception of their religious rights to that property. And even though, and you and I have discussed this, uh, your legal position, which clearly proves our position there, lies in the face of their religious position, which they don't care about. They just want it back because Jewish people being in the land of Israel is a sacrilege to them. So, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and you know, I say this with the greatest of love and respect to you. I, I, 
think that, that they, they just don't want to know. And their charters say they don't want to know. Even though I wish someone would have the patience over on their side to sit down and read your book, and then they wouldn't have any questions. Ian, I'm going to try to find the question in the midst of it. <laughs> the question really is, is, how do you tell someone who doesn't want to know what legally is the position that they should cerebrally know, but emotionally they have no desire to know? And that's a tough one. Okay, let me approach it this way. Many of you own a home. Somebody comes to your door and says, I want to occupy, I want part of your home. I want the first floor. I want to use part of your lot. And there's pressure on you to negotiate. The starting point of such a negotiation should be your own recognition that you're the owner, that you have legal title. What you do next is important as well. But the, the, the first step is that are you going to give that person an easement, a lease, a license? But you're the owner. And the fact that you're the owner has an impact on what happens next. So again, I'm here to emphasize that. In terms of uh, the demands, you know, I believe that theologically, the Muslims don't have the right to sign a peace treaty involving uh, the recognition of the rights of the Jewish people to Jerusalem or to the rest of the Holy Land. They don't have the license in their theological uh, sources to do this thing. And that's a problem. So if, if you want to be naive and go ahead and give more and think that that's going to be the end of it all, then I go, bad news. It will resurface. Don't forget the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was set up while the Palestinians of the Arabs still controlled everything that is referred to by them as the West Bank. Secretary-Treasurer of the Canadian Jewish Civil Rights Association. <clears throat> Dr. Goche, um, I'm a practicing lawyer myself, and when I listen to you, I think about um, certain things just in the legal context. I tell the junior lawyers, one of the most important things you have to do is to learn to communicate. You've done that so brilliantly today. Sometimes as lawyers we tend to obfuscate, use technical terms. You've been extremely clear to us on what are the fundamental issues that need to be addressed. And we go to the source and we see what is the legal claim, both of the Arabs and the Jews. And that's very important so there's a balance. And it's important for us as Jews and, and for the whole community, I believe, to, to understand those sources so that we can produce rational arguments and to refute some of the political and, and religious claims that are being made. You, the, the subject that we uh, entitled today's discussion was myth. You've also helped us clear away some of the myths. The, the notion that um, somehow the, the Jews in Jerusalem are unlawful occupiers. You've made that crystal clear, the source of international law and the legal rights of the Jews to the homeland. And for that, we are extremely grateful to you. Thank you very much.